I'm Ambassador Susan Johnson Cook, Susan with a Z, S-U-Z-A-N, Johnson Cook, and I hail from the villages of Harlem, New York, and Sag Harbor, New York, and I am so delighted to be with you today. I was born in Harlem, New York, in Sydenham Hospital, 1957. I was one of those what they call civil rights babies. My parents were Southern, and they moved from the South and migrated North to New York, and then they had my brother and myself. We were the beneficiaries of so many blessings. First of all, the civil rights leaders, Dr. Martin Luther King, Coretta Scott King, Dorothy Height, John Lewis, who was on a plane with me recently. We are the beneficiaries of all their hard work. My parents in this generation had to be in the fields. They worked seasonally, and then they went to school, became educated, went back and taught their brothers, sisters, cousins, nieces, nephews, and then they moved to New York, met on their first day in New York, fell in love, and had us. So I am such a blessed child. I was born into a Christian family. I was born in the village of Harlem when it was bustling. Harlem Renaissance was happening. There was jazz on Lenox Avenue. The churches were the center of our lives. We had neighbors and friends, and everyone was proud to be an African American. We were clean. We were neat. We were articulate. We were always surrounded by greatness. So failure was not an option. In our churches, we sat next to the first black judges and the first black astronauts and the first black teachers, and it was a wonderful village. So they would lean over to me as a child, three, four, five years old, just starting my little words in kindergarten and say, what college are you going to? I said, I'm just getting ready to read. They were like, no, and they were planting the seeds of education and greatness because they were modeling what greatness looked like and how it took effort to get where they were. And so it would take effort for us to get where we were going to be, but we were building on their legacy. And so for me now, it's a wonderful experience to remember and reflect back on all of those who made it possible for me to be an ambassador of the United States of America, to work for not just one president, and I am so honored to have been appointed by President Barack Obama and nominated by Secretary Hillary Clinton, but I also had the experience of working with President Bill Clinton in the White House as a White House fellow and a domestic policy analyst. I worked for three cabinet secretaries, Secretary Henry Cisneros, where we developed the first faith-based initiatives, Secretary Hillary Clinton, and now Secretary John Kerry. I recently retired and I took about four months for a sabbatical because as exhilarating as the position was, it was also exhausting. I, as the ambassador at large for international religious freedom, was the only ambassador who was the advisor to the president and the secretary of state on the issues of religious freedom internationally, which meant I lived in Washington at large, and I had all 199 countries under my portfolio. And so I did about 28 of those countries under my watch. Wonderful, wonderful experience to be an African-American woman at the table of diplomacy, to be with the Pope at the Vatican, to be with government leaders, to be with civil society leaders, to be with faith leaders all over the world, and to be the United States representative. But that came from the seeds that my parents sowed in me, the late Dorothy and Wilbur Johnson, who made it sure that whatever I could do, whatever I dreamed about doing, they tried to help make that possible. And so they took their meager incomes, and in those days, $4,000 was a lot of money, and they would put it into allowing me to go to private school where I was exposed to so many things in the world. So that at 10th grade, I could go to Spain and study Spanish and become a bilingual African-American girl coming back to a neighborhood that was becoming Latinized. And so my friends, mainly Puerto Ricans at that time, my friends and I would hang together, and I could translate for them, and they could translate for me, and we had this wonderful friendship. Diversity was a way of life. I lived in a high-rise apartment in the Yankee Stadium area of New York City, where the Bronx Bombers were. And it was a predominantly Jewish neighborhood when we moved in, but as we moved in, the neighborhood was becoming more and more diverse. So it was a high-rise apartment. We had 17 apartments on each floor. 11 of those were different ethnicities, <laughs> races, cultures, religions. And so we learned to grow up as playmates understanding that, yes, there are some differences, but there's a whole lot that we have in common. So diversity was a way of life for me. Well, later in life, I graduated from Riverdale Country School, went to Emerson College in Boston, studied mass communications and studied theater and speech. It was there that I made the decision. I remember doing oral interpretation. It was A Raisin in the Sun, a scene from Lorraine Hansberry's A Raisin in the Sun. 
And there was a scene between Mama, Walter, and Benita. And I had to be all three characters, and I had to convince my class and the teacher that I was in that scene. And I remember the teacher standing up and giving me a standing ovation. And it was there that I made the decision that I wanted to use my speech for the rest of my life to make a profession, not knowing where that was going to take me. And it was there that I really became so embraced by so many people. It was a church that we went to in Cambridge, Massachusetts, near Harvard University. The bishop now, who was then the Reverend John Bryant, was our pastor, an AME pastor, and his wife, Cecilia. And they had big afros and dashikis. It was a very Afrocentric church, an AME church, St. Paul AME. And there we were in, in worship with college students and graduate students who were just so brilliant and intellectual. Ron McNair, one of the first black astronauts to go into space, was in our congregation. And there were others who have become famous. And we sang in this choir called the New Temple Singers. There was such an anointing on the house. And in that choir, which were about 60 voices, about 30 of us became leading pastors in the United States of America. And we are now colleagues in ministry. But it was a wonderful, wonderful place where we could be African American and Christian and still be college students. And all of our gifts were used in one place. So I graduated mass communications from Boston. And then I came here to Washington, DC for my first job. WJLA TV on Van Ness area, on Connecticut Avenue. And there it was a, still a small station where there were lots of people, but we were a family. And to this day, about 37 years later, we're still friends. Uh, Locke McCarthy and Renee Poussin and Thursa Crittenden and Alexis Revis Yeoman and Mary Braxton, who did editorials, we're all still friends because of that wonderful seed that was planted. I went to seminary, became a pastor of three congregations in New York City, and then I applied for the White House Fellowship under President Clinton, received it, came down here, and worked on the Domestic Policy Council, as I said, HUD, and then went back home, had a sabbatical at Harvard University, the Divinity School, because Harvard was looking for more administrators who were diverse, African Americans and Latinos, and so I went for a year at Harvard. And then I came back to Washington. President Clinton invited me to be one of seven advisors on what he called the President's Initiatives on Race. It was going to be part of his legacy. It was his last two years in office. The late Dr. John Hope Franklin was the leader of it, and I was selected as the faith advisor. So we got to fly all over the country looking at the matter of race. Can there be one America? And so we were so blessed to have that experience. Went back home, continued to pastor, married, had my family, two wonderful sons who are now in college, and then I was nominated to be the ambassador at large for international religious freedom. And now I've moved back to Washington, DC. It is such a blessed life. I take nothing for granted. I know that hard work is important. I know that being surrounded by greatness is important. I know that prayers and faith are important. I know that friends and the people who surround you are important. And I've had the blessing of having all of that. And now I also try to give that to others. So at this stage in life, as I begin another chapter, I am so thankful for the life I've had. I have no regrets. There have been bumps along the way. There have been lumps along the way. There have been places that people have not appreciated or have not been kind. But you know what? You take the hand that you've been dealt, and you play it. And you try to play it well with integrity, with values, with love, and with thanksgiving. And so now at this stage in life, I have been very passionate about other women leaders so that I won't be the first only, but I'll be the first of many. And so I'm developing what's called the pro-voice movement that invites people of color and women of faith to come together so that we can help not only leaders who exist now understand how to get to the top, how to stay on top without toppling over, and we find emerging leaders so that we bring them up and we pour into them that which you've learned. Because I've learned that you have to have what I call the well project, women in wealth. You have to be enterprising. You have to have life balance. That means putting boundaries in places. You have to have legacy and leadership skills. We've got to leave something for the generation now that will succeed us. And so I'm there. I'm very blessed to begin that. 
I to have get a... where you want to go, it takes effort. It takes having a dream and trying to always have that in front of you, looking towards your destination. It takes not being distracted or thrown off guard or thrown off track. It takes having a what I call a destiny circle, people who surround you and celebrate you, not just tolerate you. It takes, as Yolanda, Yolanda Vinant says, it takes doing your work. So whether that's emotionally you have to get help, whether that's taking time out of each day to just meditate and center yourself, whether that's just waking up and then hitting the ground running, saying that I am going to make this day the best day of my life. Every day you have to put effort. Every day you have to put energy. Every day you have to go with your A game. Every day. You know, building on our legacy is so important. We say it in the African American National Anthem, you know, God of our weary years, God of our silent tears, thou who has by thy might kept us into the light, keep us forever on the path we pray. That path has been blazed by those who have gone before us. It took blood, sweat, and tears for them to get the right to vote, to live in certain neighborhoods, for us to go to the schools we go to, for those of us to hold the positions that we hold. Someone went before us to pave the way. That's legacy. We at a certain age, after we've achieved, we have to think about what legacy are we going to leave for the generation who follows us. So it means we're always reaching back to someone who helped us and saying thank you, remembering the generation that preceded us. But it's also about reaching for someone who's coming and saying, how can I help you? What can I do? Well, Planting that, seeds is so important. It means putting something in the ground so that you can reap a harvest. So whether that's time in, doing an internship, sometimes it's paid and sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's volunteering, helping a senior citizen, going to do their grocery shopping. And sometimes it's just doing more time on the job. So if the job ends at five, you may need to stay to six or you may need to come in an hour earlier. I remember my first time working at the White House, and I had a nine-month-old son, but I was determined to live and move near the White House so I would never miss a day. And I would get in around 7.30 thinking that was early. I would always come in, and someone had already read the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and they were having conversations about that paper. So for me, that meant getting up another hour earlier, making sure my child was secured in daycare, and then going to the White House. So it means putting the time in so that you reap a harvest. But because of that, people see you when you don't even think they're watching. Because of that, I got three other appointments to the White House by presidents. So you never know, but you put the time in doing the best job you can where you are, not always looking for what's ahead, but saying thank you for what I have in my hands right now. Let me do something with it. You know, Sheryl Sandberg and others have been all over the papers talking about leaning in. I believe as an African-American woman and as a woman who's a woman of color that we can't lean in until we get in. So if you want a seat at the table, it takes a whole lot that other cultures already normally have, but that we have to build into. Everything in life, I found, is about relationships and partnerships. And sometimes you have to be in partnership with people who don't look like, who were not raised like you. And so it means crossing the aisles. And if there's one thing I think that I've been blessed with is bridge building. And maybe that's why I was one of those in that first integrating class in my neighborhood. Because you have to sometimes sit next to someone of a different ethnicity or a different race or a different religion or a different political party. But you have to again remember what is your assignment and the task that's at hand. And if others can help you to get where you need to go, receive the help. And if you can help others to get where they need to go, receive the help. Partnerships build America. You see it in the White House. You see it in your house. Partnerships build this world that we have. 
So reach out and touch somebody's hand. So it's not just about leaning in, but you want to make sure that you get in. You know, I want to speak a little bit about women and wealth. Wealth is so important because we are in a capitalistic society and I dare say a capitalistic world. You have to have funds to fuel whatever it is you're trying to go after and attain. And so the worst thing is to be with someone who doesn't have the money or who overspends what they have in their budget and so they're li living broke, busted, and disgusted. No, my parents were such a blessing because they taught us in high school how to invest and how to save. I remember in my elementary school that Dime Savings Bank came to the classroom and we gave 10 cents, a nickel, a quarter, a dollar, whatever we had, and we saw that bank book grow so that by the time we got to sixth grade, we had a good chunk of change. Well, the same thing needs to happen, but in a bigger way as you become an adult. You have to make wise investments because you want to make sure you have the funds for tuition, for your play money, for your life, for your rent, for your mortgages. One of the reasons I was able to take four months off, take a CELA, was because I had six months of savings. Susie Orman will tell you that you need six months of your expenses. So I knew that my tuition money for two children in college would be paid. I knew that my rent and my mortgage on the home we own would be paid. And I still had money to be able to go out to dinner and to do some things when I needed to. You must have wealth. And that's just making sure that you have a flow for six months. I was at one of the initiatives, the Clinton Global Initiatives, and I was sitting next to a young woman in her 20s who hung up the phone and said, I'm so sorry, my family's foundation just gave a million dollars to support one of the initiatives in Africa. And I sat there and I said, you know what, so many of us who are raised in minority communities, we teach our children to go for the humanities and then learn how to write grants and ask for the check. Here was a young woman who had gone to business school, formed a family foundation, and they give the check. So we must make sure that we build wealth, not again just for our, for our generation, but intergenerational transfer of wealth so that our children and their children grow up strong in character, integrity, and with some money. I want you to know that you, beloved, are wonderful, wonderful people, wonderful women, wonderful men. I want to give you these five P's as I close today. Play, pray, plan, purge, and pack. Pack those things that are necessary to put away in your life. Purge those things that are necessary to throw away in your life and do not serve you well any longer. Play, have a good balance in your life. Pray so that you connect to the spirit however you choose to connect to the spirit and plan. There's a great life right now, but there's a greater life ahead of you and you ain't seen nothing yet. No ha toda vista nada. You haven't seen anything yet. The best is yet to come.